So today I'll be talking about T-Rex and how my lab's using them to try to treat autoimmune diseases. So broadly speaking, um, the CD40 helper cells, which most of you would have heard about at least, can be divided into the pro-inflammatory ones. We've got the which are your Th1, Th17 and Th2 types, which have their master transcription factors. And they're good for different things, for um, protective immunity, such as fighting off intracellular bacteria, or getting rid of fungi and extracellular bacteria, or for making antibodies and getting rid of big extracellular pathogens. Then you've got these um, anti-inflammatory T cells, which are defined as transcribing FOXP3, and they're generally known as uh, the T-Rex. Um, <coughs> these regulatory T cells play an important role in controlling overt responses from these pro-inflammatory cells. So the T-Rex, um, after killing off your invading pathogen, these regulatory T cells stop um, the overt responses. Otherwise, uh, you develop an autoimmune disease. So in most autoimmune diseases, there are now um, publications or uh, studies that show that in most autoimmune diseases, there are either a reduction in number or a dysregulation in these regulatory T cells. Uh, the, your pro-inflammatory cells start having overt responses, get more cytokines and more inflammatory uh, mediators, and you get diseases such as IPEX, uh, lupus, RA, MS, uh, glomerulonephritis. I'll be focusing a bit on glomerulonephritis mainly because that's just been my area of study for the last 15 odd years. <coughs> and one of I think, in a biased opinion, one of, the best of, uh, one of the best examples of regulatory T cells suppressing an uh, antigen-specific autoimmune response come from this glomerul autoimmune glomerulonephritic disease known as anti-GBM or glomerular base me membrane disease. In this disease, there is a single autoantigen known as the alpha-3 for NC1. It's a one-hit disease whereby I think at the moment about 90% of patients survive and patients that survive never almost never have a relapse. <coughs> and uh, what this study showed was that if you depleted the regulatory T cells in these patients that are in remission, you get this unmasking of antigen-specific responses against the alpha-3 for NC1, <coughs> which goes to show that um, regulatory T cells are actually actively suppressing pro-inflammatory responses against the known target autoantigen. Um, in another of my diseases that I study, known as anchor-associated vasculitis, uh, studies have shown that if you, re, uh, if you compare the T-Rex suppressive capacity of patients, the like AAV patients, mm -hmm. compare them with healthy controls, you can see that these T-Rex isolated from patients have a much poorer suppressive capacity. It's another example of um, the importance of regulatory T cells in controlling disease. So early in my postdoctoral career, I used this model known as experimental anti-GBM disease. In this uh, model of disease, we immunize mice with sheep globulin, then we transfer in uh, sheep anti-mouse GBM antibodies which deposit in the kidney. And because we sensitize the mice against sheep globulin, um, they, they have pro-inflammatory T cells go into the kidney and basically destroy the kidney. We can measure disease by uh, the number of glomerulus that have segmental necrosis, glomerular crescents, which, are, which is a really a mark of end-stage kidney failure, as well as tuberculosis tissue injury. <coughs> What we do find is that um, when disease is fairly severe, there is actually an infiltration of uh, FOXP3 T regulatory cells into the kidney. And we can confirm their phenotype by having both CD4 and FOXP3 by confocal microscopy. So determine what these T regs are actually doing in the kidney. Are they actually um, protecting from disease? We use FOXP3 DTR mice, whereby injection of the diphtheria toxin into these mice gets rid of uh, approximately 90% of these uh, regulatory T cells. Well, what I found was that after depletion of regulatory T cells, there's a significant increase in uh, glomerular injury, including functional injury measured by proteinuria, thereby demonstrating that these regulatory T cells that are going into the kidney are actually actively suppressing disease severity. So this and many other studies in experimental models of autoimmune disease have shown that T-Rex are important. Um, in the last few years, uh, there have been a few clinical trials that try to increase the numbers or expand the numbers of T-Rex into people. I'll just talk about a couple of them. Um, one such study that Eric Moran has been involved in is the one um, published in Nature Medicine a few years ago, where um, 
the authors, the, the researchers, the doctors, they gave patients low dose IL-2. And what this did was it increased the number of regulatory T cells in the patient. Um, and this correlated with a decrease in the T follicular helper cells, which were responsible for making the pathogenic autoantibodies, as well as the pro-inflammatory TH17 cells. Uh, this uh, reduced the disease activity in the patients, as well as um, it allowed for a significant reduction in the use of these toxic steroids in these patients. Um, there are also now studies in uh, diabetes and one in lupus, whereby uh, it is now possible to take out regulatory T cells in small numbers, expand them quite significantly and transfer them back into patients. And this particular study uh, from San Francisco showed that uh, these T-Rex actually survive for quite long, up to a year. So 25% of these ex vivo expanded T-Rex uh, last up to a year in patients. However, <coughs> using this um, preliminary phase one trial, they did not manage to show a clinical efficacy. Um, these protocols are now fairly uh, broad, commonplace and quite standard. And, and in, in uh, this paper published last year, in a kidney transplant paper, you can actually, using this protocol, which my lab's also doing, you can get a uh, greater than 100-fold increase in the numbers of regulatory T cells. And these T-Rex were highly uh, maintained their phenotype, so they kept their suppressive phenotype. They were CD25 high, uh, CD127 low, and they were uh, demethylated at the FOXP3 region, which is the best marker for suppressive capacity. <coughs> and in this study, they showed that in nine of the nine recipients, they all still had a functioning kidney after 12 months. And this is a suppression assay showing that these T-Rex um, do maintain their suppressive phenotype, which was the biggest worry when people were trying to ex expand this uh, human T-Rex ex vivo. So um, my lab's focus on making antigen-specific T-Rex. Given that these um, protocols are quite robust, now you can get as many T-Rex as you want. Why bother making them specific for your autoantigen? So, I think the main reason is because in, in lots of cancer studies, T-Rex are bad. The more T-Rex you get, uh, the more likely you are to develop cancer. So if you just transfer in a whole bucket load of T-Rex, it will most likely increase your, your chance of developing a, a cancer. This study is just one of many in renal cell carcinoma, showing that patients with renal cell carcinoma do have more of these FOXP3 positive cells. And the higher numbers of T-Rex that you do have um, negatively correlates with the chances of survival. So in theory, if we could make antigen-specific T-Rex, we could use much lower numbers, and the numbers that we and the T-Rex that we do transfer in would work much better because they could um, directly energize the autoantigen-specific effector T cells. They would actively outcompete effector cells for present for binding of the autoantigen, and they would tolerate the dendritic cells that are presenting the autoantigen. <coughs> Therefore, you would need a lot less. However, there is not, there, had, there hadn't been, before our studies, there hadn't been much evidence for their potency in humans. Um, one of the biggest studies to support the use of antigen specific T rex comes from Electrodensis <coughs> Group uh, in New York, and they used, this is in a mouse study, they showed that um, specific ablation of the TCR and regulatory T cells significantly reduce the suppressive capacity. So after stimulation, if you deplete the regulatory t the T cell receptor, sorry, you had a much lower expression of the key suppressive genes such as LAC3, CTL4, and IL10. <coughs> but apart from this study, which basically just showed that if you, your TR is a TCR, it's better, there hadn't been um, much studies supporting the use of antigen specific TRX. And this is where our studies in good partial disease really, I think, in a very biased way, <laughs> showed that they are actually important. So going back to good partial disease, which is just another name for anti-GBM disease. Uh, we use it as a model disease um, because it's got a single autoantigen, but also because it's got a really strong HLA association. This is a forest plot of a meta-analysis of three epidemiological studies showing that if you inherit DR15, you have a much higher hazard ratio, odds ratio of developing disease. <coughs> what is interesting about this disease is that when you inherit um, DR1 along with HLA DR15, um, you get this um, dominant protective effect. To visualize this a bit better, um, this is the general population. Uh, people who inherit DR15 are about 10%. People who inherit DR1 are about 
in the good pastures patient population, more than 85% of, of the patients develop are DR15, whereas less than 1% are uh, DR1. And if you are, the, the blue person actually represents a per people, including people who are DR1 and DR15. So it's got a dominant protective effect. If you've got DR1, your risk of developing disease is just as good as a, a healthy person, even though you have DR15. So um, our study was, why does this happen? Why, why are these people protected? And because HL is important in presenting T cell epitopes to T cells, we, we generated HLA transgenic mice, um, which were DR15, DR1, or both DR15 and DR1 positive on, a, on, the, on the same background. And <clears throat> all that's really important here is that we managed to map the key immunodominant T cell epitope, or alpha 3 for NC1, and using DR15 mice, using pro-inflammatory assays such as pro proliferation, interferon gamma, and R17. And we could show that this particular epitope was not pro-inflammatory in the context of DR1 or mice carrying DR15 or DR1. So here we had a really good system to study the effect that we see in humans, this HLA dominant effect. Um, in collaboration with the Rostral Laboratory of at Monash, we made tetramers both HLA DR15 and DR1, presenting the good pastures epitope, which we mapped and worked out the critical residues. We used these tetramers to identify antigen-specific T cells, both in the good pasture patient population, in healthy humans, as well as in our transgenic mice. And um, the key finding from our study was that if you were DR15, so if you had a high susceptibility for disease, you had significantly more um, T conventional pro-inflammatory cells specific for this good pasture antigen, whereas if you were DR1 and you're protected from disease, you actually had more antigen specific T-Rex. So the numbers of T-Rex that both groups of people had were identical, very similar, but it was the numbers of T-Rex that were specific for the antigen that was significantly increasing these people who were protected. If you were heterozygous uh, for DR15 and DR1, um, and we used the DR1 tetramer, you had more um, regulatory T-cells, but if we used the DR15 tetramer, you had mostly <laughs> conventional cells, thereby suggesting that this DR1 plays a dominant role by specifically activating these DR1-restricted um, regulatory T cells. To prove that it's more than just numbers, that this actually had a functional effect, we did a co-culture assay with T-Rex and T-conventional cells in, in different uh, groups of people. <coughs> and what we can see is that if T-Rex are in the population, you have um, IL-10 being made, so anti-inflammatory IL-10 being made by people who are DR1 or heterozygous for DR1 and you could actually measure this proliferation of antigen-specific regulatory T cells only if you had DR1, not DR15. If we remove the regulatory T cells from the population, you get this unmasking of um, a pro-inflammatory IL-17, pro-inflammatory interferon gamma in people who are heterozygous, demonstrating that this DR1 T-REC activation, this acti antigen-specific T-REC activation was dominantly suppressing the pro-inflammatory response. We also developed a disease uh, model in this HLA humanized transgenic mice, and we showed a very similar result to the in vitro pro uh, inflammatory assay, <coughs> a cytokine uh, assay, <coughs> where if you deplete the regulatory T cells, you get the unmasking of disease only in the uh, heterozygous mice that were both DR15 and DR1. So these studies demonstrate that the antigen specific regulatory T cells were indeed um, suppressing inflammatory responses and therefore suppressing uh, autoimmune disease. Okay. So we also did this assay, which is a little bit more definitive. We cultured, we wanted to show that it was indeed that the antigen specific T-Rex were actually more suppressive than T-Rex, but it's really difficult to, to isolate this antigen specific T-Rex because they were really rare. In one mouse, you may get 100 or 200 cells. In a human from 50 mils of blood, you'll get about 200 maximum. So we did this assay where we cultured um, uh, cells from a transgenic mouse that, was, that expressed both DR15 and DR1. And <coughs> in, we cultured with antigen-specific T-Rex or we tetramer sorted out these antigen-specific T-Rex. And the effect that you get with just polyclonal and polyclonal T-Rex is the brown bar. So looking at proliferation, you do get an effect compared to the red with just T effector cells alone. But in the presence of the antigen-specific T-Rex, so <coughs> you get these blue bars. This study 
this study demonstrated that when you have antigen specific T rex, you get this much stronger suppression. So in proliferation, you do get about <coughs> better, but if you look at other cytokines, like interferon gamma, IL-17, IL-6, you get a complete abrogation of these inflammatory cytokines, demonstrating a very much more potent effect using energy specific T-Rex in the culture. So in the paper, we managed to link the numbers of energy specific T-Rex to the structure of how the, the DR1 presented the peptide. And here you've got the MHC, the HLA DR15. Uh, presenting the peptide. We're going to be looking down into the peptide binding cleft and what you'll be able to see is that the cleft is fairly um, big here and it allows for the aromatic rings of the tryptophan and the phenylalanine to sit within the peptide binding cleft. In a second we'll overlay the DR1 and what I'd like to draw attention to is that the cleft in the middle, so pocket 4 and pocket 6 are much smaller and what happened, what happens is that um, the peptide is forced outward, the rings can no longer bind within those pockets because they're too small and they form a more prominent, prominent position which what we believe and we're looking at it now is our more prominent T-cell contact points. And this structure sort of fits with the um, current dogma where T-rex are of more high affinity so being more prominent will, will form stronger contact points and therefore drive uh, more T-rex to be generated in the thymus. Mm. So now that we've shown that antigen specific T-Rex are important and there are less of them in the patient population, uh, my lab has been focusing on ways to develop antigen specific T-Rex. There are a few other ways, I'll talk about three of them which we are currently experimenting with. Um, the first one is liposomes. Liposomes are lipid bilayer vesicles uh, that are currently used for drug or peptide delivery in patients. The ones that we use uh, come from um, Professor Thomas's group in Queensland. And these ones are sized and charged to target the marginal zone macrophages, which, are, have a, which can stimulate regulatory T cells. Uh, the ones that we use have an NF, are co encapsulated with an NF kappa B inhibitor. Uh, in this case, we used uh, calcitriol or vitamin D3. What we showed was that if we treated our mice in, our, in a mouse model that I talked about before with liposomes, we can increase the number of antigen specific T Rex. So these are tetramer specific uh, T Rex in the DR15 mice. You can double the numbers. And when we double the numbers, we can show that um, disease is mm, completely abrogated. As a control, we use the OVA one. So, we, so the mice, instead of developing antigen specific T Rex specific for the group partial epitope, they have antigen specific T Rex for a, a control antigen and these mice do not get suppression of disease. Um, in the other disease that I study, anchor associated vasculitis, we have identified a hotspot within the molecules. So it's a fairly big molecule of about 750 amino acids. What we found in the middle of the uh, mm, protein, there is a region that's got the CD4 epitope, the B cell epitope, and the CD8 T cell epitope. This is in human, humanized mice and in um, our patient populations. And this is a, so you're using peptide, so we design a peptide that's about 30 amino acids long. And when we nasally insufflate these mice with, um, this, when we nasally insufflate uh, mice with this peptide, we can show that we uh, can make antigen specific T Rex specific for this MPO peptide. And this MPO, so this disease is MPO. Um, MPO is myeloproxidase, which is a neutrophil antigen. I won't go into too much detail right now. Um, but we can show that these MPO specific FOXP3 positive T Rex do have a higher capacity for suppressing an autoreactive response against MPO. And similar, similar to um, previous uh, disease, when we treat the mice before, after, when we treat the mice, after MPO autoimmunity is induced, we can get a reduction in uh, functional injury measured by proteinuria, as well as a reduction in histological injury markers, including fewer T cells and fewer macrophages that get recruited to the kidney because we've increased the number of energy specific T Rex. Okay. <coughs> right. 
Okay, lastly, lastly, uh, this is fairly new, it's not published yet, but um, our lab's been spending a lot of time and money trying to develop this ability to actually transduce T cell receptors, specific for antigens, onto regulatory T cells. So instead of injecting something to a patient or putting a peptide up the nose, what we think, what we can do now is actually get a T cell receptor specific for an autoantigen, put it into a lentiviral construct. So instead of a CAR T cell for cancer, we put a TCR into a lentiviral construct and then we recruit, we isolate uh, these T-Rex from patients and we can actually transduce the antigen specific T cell receptor onto regulatory T cell and transfer the, those regulatory T cells into, back into a patient. So we have isolated um, T cell receptors uh, from good pastures patients. Um, this shows that in good pastures patients, there are more uh, antigen specific pro inflammatory cells. What we can do, this is patient orange, we've done it in a few patients. When we single cell sequence the paired alpha beta T cell receptor, we can show that up to 50% of these T cells all express the same T cell receptor, which is very strong evidence for clonal expansion and reactivity of that T cell receptor to the antigen. We can take that T cell receptor, clone it into our vector, and then we transfect by spin oculation, and we get human T Rex, which are 25 high, 127 low, and we now can get up to 90% transduction efficiency. So after expansion, so we can get um, a lot of cells, expand them more than 104, and get 90% of those cells all expressing the same T cell receptor. So you're going from a frequency of 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 1,000 of antigen specific T Rex. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, in summary, I've shown that regulatory T cells do play a role in attenuating autoimmune disease that antigen-specific T-Rex are more potent suppressors of autoimmunity. And now my lab and others are developing fairly robust protocols for, the do for generating antigen-specific T-Rex. And this, we think, will be one future of uh, antigen-specific therapy in autoimmune disease. Uh, thank you. So <coughs> my lab's about a year old, that's, uh, that's us. And the work's been done by lots of people. And thank you to my funders, thank you.